Let's just have a look at a patient where we're going to discuss these issues about management. So let's look at Alex, who's 16. Now, she has delayed menarche, all right. She's actually sexually active because she thinks if she doesn't have her periods that she can't get pregnant. And we have talked to you about if you can have an ovulation and be pregnant without a period. And she's very embarrassed by her increasing hirsutism. And it is causing, it is causing her loss of self-esteem. And we have a look at her. Um, we take her blood pressure because hypertension is associated with PCOS. We, of course, look at her weight and her BMI, so she's quite lean. We note the androgen-dependent hair, and you can see this. So androgen-dependent hair is basically hair where men would have it. And it's hair that is darker, and um, it, so it's terminal hair as opposed to the... Do you all know the difference between that and lanugo hair, which is the fine downy hair that... A lot of women just have, you get it with thyrotoxicosis, get it actually with losing weight. And, and patients with eating disorders and underweight often have a lot of fine downy hair. And that is not androgen dependent hair and doesn't respond to anti-androgens. Um, and she doesn't look like she's got a secondary picture of PCOS and she's not virilized. And as we've discussed, her puberty, pubertal development is quite normal. And the, uh, can you see, I don't know if you can see it with the lights up, can you see that she's actually having to shave her chin? You know, patients may cover this up. You know, they may have removed, all my patients have removed every bit of hair before they come to see me. So I get out what I call my interrogation light and have a careful look and ask the patient how often they're removing hair and what they do, you know, and get a, get a feel. But you can usually still then perform a pheromone Galway score, which is just a way of assessing hair. Remember that somebody hair is actually normal for, and we, again, we don't have norms for across lots of ethnicities, but certainly for, for Caucasian women. It is normal to remove a little bit of hair, but it's not normal to remove a lot of hair all of the time. My boss in England used to say hair, he didn't worry about the Ferriman Galway score. He said it was completely patient-centred. Patient was concerned there's a problem. I find it a little bit easier when offering pharmacological management to also think there's a problem, but you can take your pick. So provisional diagnosis, I mean, after all, I'm giving you a presentation on PCOS. So, but let's just think, what additional information do we have to know about Alex, just before we leap to that, that um, conclusion? So we just have to think, as we've mentioned, about other, other points in the history that might suggest an additional or alternative diagnosis. Um, Family history of PCOS, if you look hard enough, is probably present in 40 to 50% of patients. But she's almost certainly got primary PCOS. And as I've mentioned, the occasional patient, and this is the problem when you see lots of primary PCOS, could have something that presents like, P like primary PCOS but has another underlying cause. And tumour is the most important one to exclude. So the tests that are going to be helpful and we've talked about the tests, the level of the test, the height of the testosterone, excluding hyperprolactinemia, excluding other things with the gonadotrophins, and additional tests. We get, we get pushback in Auckland. We have persuaded our biochemists who are a bit frightened of the endocrinologists that we are allowed to do these extra tests. And again, just to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And sometimes the, the testosterone will be very normal, but you'll get elevation of other androgens. So it just perhaps helps you in the diagnosis of hyperandrogenism. And f most people would say, don't test for Cushing's and risk a false positive unless clinically you think there's some evidence. Um, and I tend to do the metabolic screening, so check their blood pressure and do their non-fasting lipids and a hemoglobin A1C with the initial workup, particularly in the younger patients, but also just to save people's time and energy and time off work if I think PCOS is likely. And as, as mentioned, pelvic ultrasound, um, the new guideline has been a little bit more negative about pelvic ultrasound, but we think we get value in terms of endometrial thickness. So a patient with PCOS who's had no periods for some years, and patients are very relaxed about that. They enjoy the lack of periods, but they may be at risk of endometrial hyperplasia or even cancer. So I like to know what the endometrium's doing if we've got that history. And again, trying to decide between the hypothalamic amenorrhea, the overlap condition, you know, um, versus clear-cut PCOS. So back to Alex. So... Tests really looking like PCOS, 
normal metabolic screening, as you'd probably expect from, from a girl who's lean, elevated testosterone, and actually notice slightly elevated androstenedione as well, doesn't have CAH, has PCO morphology, and has a normal endometrium. All right. Now, hang on, just... Uh Okay, so I think we've probably covered this. When to consider diagnosis of adolescent PCOS? And the premature adrenarche is interesting. So these patients may have late menarche, but early development of body hair. So when I'm seeing a six or seven year old with body hair, I will warn mum that she it might be a PCOS patient later on and to come back, you know, maybe in the mid to late teens and if at all possible to avoid significant weight gain and keep a healthy lifestyle. Um, periods should become regular. The majority of girls will actually have normal periods within a year of menarche, but certainly within two to three years. So don't, please don't keep saying that the irregular periods that persist during the adolescence are just because you're a teenager. You're probably missing either the PCOS or the hypothalamic oligomenorrhea, okay? And of course, if you've got some of these features, it might be more likely, and a patient who not only persistently has irregular periods, but has the androgen excess. But there is this overlap, and it, that may need specialist referral to sort out. Now, coming back to the treatment options. And you can see we've actually got an awful lot of options that you could consider depending on what it is that the patient wants. Okay, so you've got agents for endometrial protection, you've got agents for the androgenic symptoms, that's what our patient came in with, you've got things that are contraceptive and there may be overlap and we've got, and I think we'll, we'll leave the fertility at the moment. So let's come back to our patient. Now, there are two issues here, there's what the, your patient wants, what they come in with, but there's also what we should be doing as their physician. So that's thinking about the metabolic side of it, thinking about the endometrium. Patient may not have any thoughts about that. So she wants her body hair treated, but you as her physician have to think, as is mentioned about her endometrium, about the quality of life, about her mental health. Need She needs safe contraception. She's Just because she hasn't had periods, she might um, have an ovulation and find she's pregnant. And you need to manage her, not just now, but Give her recommendations for lifestyle as she goes forward to maintain her with as less trouble with the PCOS as you can manage. And that is going to be, and, and what I say to, to my patients is that Tough Stella suggests that they should be able to run a half marathon from my office. So not just a little bit of fitness, but a lot of fitness, usually a combination of aerobic and weight bearing exercise. It would be really good not to smoke, but we know all know how difficult that is in terms of uh, adolescence. And what you want to do is prevent weight gain. So if this our lean Alex with a BMI of 20, if she can maintain that weight, she has a very good chance of doing well in the future. So just in terms of time, let's just go forward on this a little bit. So in this patient, how many of you, having made the diagnosis, would use a, birth, a combined birth control pill? M majority? What would other people who didn't put their hand up use? Are there any other? Okay. Because it is interesting what patients come in on. So you can see there are a lot of advantages of the oral contraceptive, and they're not just contraceptive advantages. It's going to protect your endometrium. It's going to be effective for anti-androgen therapy. And of course, there are lots of non-contraceptive advantages from an OCP. But in the community, there's a lot of negativity. So again, we all have to remember, it's very arrogant to think that our patients only get advice from us. We know that they don't. They get it from their friends. They get it from Dr. Google. The older patients get it from, from their book club. You know, there's lots of other people advising and the more you can understand where they're getting advice from, the more you can perhaps counter that with some uh, science and some common sense. Um, of course, there are some contraindications, but they're relatively few and not in this patient's uh, situation. And I've just, I think you all know that. Um, and so I don't need, I don't perhaps need to, to, to go through that in detail. That's from the World Health Organization, um, just covering the differences in VTE risk. And I think VTE risk must be discussed with a patient and they must be aware. Most of my patients know about it, but they don't know what the signs of a blood clot are. 
So they'll come in from primary care and there either hasn't been a discussion or they don't know what it is they should be looking out for. So maybe just worth thinking about that. But I think also we have exaggerated. I mean, all of these risks are relatively low and much lower than actually the risks of having a blood clot when you're pregnant or postpartum. So you've got to think about what you're trying to prevent. Um, now, I've just updated that. I think we're, that's the latest update on what's funded in New Zealand and what they're called. Um, and you have got the option of the, the funded levonorgestrel pills or a pill that's got an antiandrogen in it. And I would tend to start, especially in an adolescent, a low-dose um, levonorgestrel pill, the safest pill, and then you know, make some adjustments six months, 12 months down the track. So if she didn't want it, you have got some other options. Um, I've mentioned spironolactone, which has to be covered with good quality contraception if she's sexually active. Does, does everyone heard about Vanica cream? So that's a cream that is not funded, but you can prescribe and get via Christchurch Hospital Pharmacy or the odd pharmacist in Auckland now brings it in and it inhibits uh, hair production. It's the sort of thing you can put on your face and it might be very useful using it once a day um, in limited areas while you're waiting for some of the antiandrogens to work. The antiandrogens are going to take, you know, at least six months to ta have effect on hair growth. So it can, you know, for the patient who's very miserable and upset with this, it might give some efficacy. We've talked about contraception and uh, just metformin. And what I've said is that there's usually a creative solution to suit your individual patient rather than a one size fits all. So spironolactone um, certainly can be used in the community, very, very little in the way of side effects. We do keep a bit of an eye on creatinine and potassium. I mean, if you've got someone who's also using lots of non-steroidals, and I think it's because we got, we, we got bitten with a patient whose potassium went up, and so we've suddenly measured it a little bit more than we used to. Um, don't give it alone because you do not want to feminize a male baby. So you need to manage the periods and contraception with any of the antiandrogens. Um, and in fact, it, it, um, it can actually exacerbate menorrhagia. So combining it with a pill just copes with that with that problem but in a younger patient if you've got a patient who's not sexually active and you're quite sure will you know take on board the need for contraception later on you could use spironolactone plus say cyclical Provera to manage you know their lack of periods so that would be 10 milligrams of Provera for 12 days a month and that would do her endometrium and give her a period um, and you could use spironolactone say in Alex to manage her hair growth and her acne so that's, that's a quite a popular English uh, regime. Um, in terms of monitoring, it's going to depend on her weight, her, her exercise level and her family history. But as I've alluded, be aware of all those metabolic overtones and more monitoring for the patient who's overweight and sedentary and has an adverse family history. So if mum's come in with her and has already got diabetes, you know, and there's a strong family history of cardiac disease and diabetes, take more care of this adolescent. And that's what I would do with this patient. I would start her on a low dose pill. I'd review her in six months because it's, she's not going to have much effect on hair prior to that. See whether she's comfortable with that, getting the results that she wants. Does she want you know, is she happy also to use some cosmetic measures? Um, does she want additional treatment? And of course, additional therapy means more monitoring. So again, trade off the patient's goals. Um, do you want to upgrade her to Jeanette or a Yaz or a Yasmin, depending on, on her funding, or use spironolactone? And as I say, not just the metabolic things, but consider her emotional health, mental well-being. Um, and I think we've covered those. Um, Men are, when men are, and menses should occur, and what to do about irregular periods. Um, might, I think with time, I had a second case, and I think this was really, perhaps giving the, the, the ins, this was really a, a patient with more metabolic aspects wanting fertility, and a patient that I thought that we would use metformin in. So let's just skip through that and accept that this is a Fijian Indian woman who's come to New Zealand, put on some weight, BMI 26. Now again, ethnic appropriate BMIs, and we don't have those normal ranges, but 
for instance, um, women from the Southeast Asian continent may have dyslipidemia and pre-diabetes with BMIs that are 20, 21. So you have to be ethnic appropriate. And conversely, we may be being a bit tough on our Polynesian patients who, who may be able to be heavier and not have quite such adverse. So her BMI of 26 is she's quite overweight for uh, a Fijian Indian woman. Um, and she's sedentary, so she needs to change her lifestyle. She needs to be aware of the consequences of her change in lifestyle coming to New Zealand. Metformin might be a good option, um, but could consider an oral contraceptive. Um, always cosmetic um, options, and probably in that setting, just need to emphasize to the patient that you are not going to make the hair growth worse or um, if you use any of the cosmetic options. I think there are a lot of old wives' tales out there that you can debunk. So it's always going to be combination therapy. We're going to do quite well with antiandrogens, but the combination of cosmetic and antiandrogens, the North Americans believe that, you know, over time that's the best result that we're going to get. Um, and for this lady who wanted fertility, you know, and primary care, that, that pre-pregnancy warrant of fitness, and again, I'm a little bit surprised. Some patients come in and they've been really, really well worked up with their GP and they've had all their vaccinations and they've had their cervical smear and they know about folic acid. And, and, and some come in with who are university educated and have no knowledge about prenatal folic acid. So it's very variable. Not quite sure what, the, what we're doing wrong there, but anyway. Um, lifestyle modification. Now, this is the sort of information that our patients pay for. They go to a nutritionist who tells them they must be on a low glycemic diet. That's all rubbish. <clears throat> Basically, if a patient needs to lose weight, any way that they can lose weight will affect and reduce your insulin resistance. So they don't need to spend lots of money on it. And I've just listed some things that, that are important. And I think there's a lot of information coming out and there's a lot of emphasis in this new guideline about being somehow getting this message across while being mutually respectful, making sure patients on board, establishing their concerns. But certainly even modest weight loss is amazingly effective in terms of metabolic and fertility consequences. Lots of exercise, not smoking, trying to work out what the barriers are for someone to lose weight and how you might assist. And I've put down the sort of things that I might use. I'm getting increasingly liberal. It's pretty hard to get nutritional deficiencies in New Zealand. So, you know, I'm honestly, if a patient's struggled and they've found a mechanism that works for them and they achieve weight loss, and it's not boring and they can sustain it, I'm pretty happy to go with that. So we give our patient lots of written information and websites to look at, but we're also sort of almost writing a, a blog of, look, we're not taking responsibility, but this is what's worked in other patients. And there can be some really quite unusual mechanisms. Um, this is important. There's nothing about PCOS that means you can't actually lose weight. And our PCOS patients do as well. And in our hands, they do actually remarkably well, but again, we have more time. So again, it's strategies within the practice, and it might be that one person is focusing on these sorts of conditions. You've got access to having, you might have some very skilled practice nurses, um, or you might, you might even have a nutritionist associated with the practice or someone who can do some exercise physiology. So, you know, that approach, I mean, I think we could be quite creative. Doesn't, it's not rocket science, it's, it's probably just getting a patient on board and finding a strategy that works. Um, now, just someone was asking me about metformin, and we start very slowly and work up to 850 milligrams BD, but might take four to six weeks to do that to try and avoid the gut side effects, and we monitor liver function and creatinine from time to time. That's when to refer. I think we've probably discussed those in the previous management. And... I think probably the emphasis is that you've got a lifelong condition, it's extremely common, it's, we're a fat nation and we all put on weight as we leave school and you know we do other things and have sedentary jobs, like we're all probably sitting at our computers. So really important goal is the younger you diagnose it and the more you can stop them smoking, encourage a good exercise pattern, prevent weight gain. And gently, if someone's carrying excess weight, try and bring them back to, to the, a more acceptable weight. And being aware of this, you know, that, that it is more than just a cosmetic condition. 
and they're just a couple of extra information sites that might be might be useful for you so thank you for your attention